Welcome back to the Dear Christians podcast as we continue our conversation with Bill Bernadoni in part two of Leaving the GOP for Jesus. We start this part of the conversation by Bill reacting to a statement made by Rand Paul about the GOP not really being pro-life. Check this out. I will tell you that we still lose in the legislation. We still lose and sometimes we lose because the people who come to you and give you lip service and say, oh, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-life, and then they don't seem to vote that way. I'll give you an example. Last year, I tried to attach to a spending bill a prohibition to have any money spent by Planned Parenthood. You know what happened? They sat me down, and one of the senior Republican senators said, we cannot have the vote today. I said, why? He said, we might win. I'm not kidding you. This is a senior Republican sitting next to me on the floor of the Senate saying, we're not going to vote to defund Planned Parenthood because we might win. And I said, what does this mean? I said, does this mean that passing your spending bill, getting the Democrats to vote for your spending bill is more important than life? And he just smiled. See, that's what the thing is. You have Republicans that are more concerned with spending money than protecting the unborn. And there you go. (laughs) There's a lot of truth to that, and there's some fiction in what he said as well. Okay. Let's Um, let's break it apart. What? Where do you feel the fiction is for starters? So the 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 fiction is that bill that he attached it to. It didn't really have much of a chance to pass that was talk to the audience he was talking to he was talking to the faith and freedom coalition if i'm not mistaken so he was he was guilty of providing lip service to his own audience there when he was talking is what you're saying y- yes in in my in my humble opinion yes okay. um because that whole defund planned parenthood thing maybe if you're talking a simple majority at that point in the Senate could have happened, but I don't think that passes the House. I could be wrong, but I see that I see that as lip service. I don't think that had a real chance to pass. Okay. So then where is the truth in what he's saying then? The truth in what he's saying is that Republicans play lip service to the life movement. That is 100% accurate. And it's not just on the life movement. They play lip service to the life movement. Democrats pay lip service to X, Y, and Z. Here's what they wanted, because I do believe that conversation probably happened. What that Republican senator is really saying, we want the talking point. Mm. We want the talking point. We, We don't want this to go away. We don't want this to pass because we want it for the next election cycle. Mm. So rather than really being about actually getting it done, it's more about using it as a really hot button topic to gain the support of a large base that they need in order to stay in power. Why do you think nothing has been done still on immigration? Why do you think nothing has been done still in regards to a variety of issues, so, social security, yeah. why nothing? Because these are hot button issues that drive people to the polls. Yeah. Okay. Healthcare. Why do Republicans continue, continue to talk about Obamacare <laughs> when it's in stone? It's not going anywhere. People are used to it. Why do they still talk? Why do they still talk about it? It's an awful law. It's awful, but it's not going anywhere. It's not. Why do they still talk about it? Because it drives people to the polls. They're going to be running on it in the next election. Yeah. Wrongly, I might add, running on it in the next election because guess what? It drives people to the polls. Yeah. All they care about is getting you amped up saying, if you vote for our people, we'll do X, Y, and Z. Well, guess what? Have x y and z been addressed no no they haven't no they haven't so then how do you handle the uh opinion of people who would say we have to keep trying and we have to stay involved in politics i mean if you just have a callous approach to it then why be involved in it at all so okay i 
<laughs> I can see where someone, a listener now would say, okay, then why would I get involved when I just said what I just said about yeah. how Republicans are manipulative, Democrats are manipulative. It's difficult to make any substantial changes. Why would I do it? Yeah. I know what my answer would be, but I'm, I'm curious what yours would be. I'll maybe give mine after you. But. <laughs> mine, is, mine is rather simple. Um, if I find someone, if I find someone who truly and honestly wants to make a difference, who stands up for what I believe in, even someone that I have some disagreements with, but their heart is in the right place. Their eyes are on the Lord, no matter what political party they belong to. Yeah. They're not in it for the power. They're not in it for the money. They're not in it for the cushy job after your time in Congress, which is what a lot of these people are in it for, mm -hmm. for the $400,000 consulting gig at XYZ company or XYZ defense contractor or on Wall Street after their time is up. Yeah. So would you consider supporting or working for a Democrat that was pro-life? Um, or is that not, you're, you're still very, very conservative on a lot of like fiscal issues, I know too, so probably not, but... It, it would take, for me to work with a Democrat, it would take one hell of a Democrat. <laughs> Fair enough. I, 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 a Democrat that's I a Republican, right? <laughs> <laughs> Like like JFK. Yeah, and that's an interesting conversation that we could get into some other time about the transitioning of the parties in general. But yeah, that, that's um, that's an, that's another that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Um. But no, I'm 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 still very conservative. I believe in limited government. Yeah. L unlike the current Republican Party, I believe in in lower taxes. I believe in the issue of life. I believe in all that that the Republican Party claims to stand for currently, but doesn't. And so if I find someone, even, even someone who supports the current administration, if their hearts are in the right place, if their eyes are on the Lord, and they're not in it for selfish reasons, I would work, I would work for them. Okay. It's not about you have to agree with me 100% of the time. That, that's no, no of, course, no, of course not. It's about where's your heart? And where's your mind? For me, I feel like my answer would be very simple. Don't get involved in politics. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, my, that's my response. Don't get involved in politics. And Dan, I have been there. Yeah. This is like why this is so complicated for me. Because a lot of my fondest memories outside of my children being born and my, and my wedding are, 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 on the, are on the campaign trail. But it has become so difficult to be both a follower of Christ and work in this industry that I had to step aside. I had to, to protect myself, my family, and my children. I didn't have a choice in the matter. I didn't. I, I didn't have a choice in the matter. But if you're in a place where you have people who will hold you accountable to where you know for a fact that you won't be swallowed up by the power, the prestige, the money, the this and the that, and you're working for people that you honestly believe in. That was another big part of it for me. More and more, I was taking jobs. I was taking jobs to take jobs. Yeah. And that was difficult for me to do. And that's something that I would never do in the future. Okay. Never. So then I, I can't help but note that the timing of you leaving coincided with the election of Donald Trump. Yes. And, and I know we haven't talked about him really much at all, but I feel like he has had an impact on the political climate that the church had already kind of been deeply immersed in. And his, his candidacy and then his election, I feel like that, and I don't want this to just turn into a, a Trump bashing session because I know I'm, I'm not a fan of the president um, on a like character level. I just, I, I do not like him uh, as a person. Um, mm -hmm. But I 
don't want this to be about just bashing him. I want this oh, no, to really no be means, more no like means. a conversation about what impact his election maybe had on that transition for you, if any, and how how you feel maybe his election changed politics or changed the church. If that had any impact on your decision at all, I think it's worth bringing here's, up. Here's where I'm at with that. So this whole thing, my depression started in November of 2015. And I was fighting with this partially because at this time, this is when Republicans and conservatives had started to come on board with the current president. But the final straw was the outright support, the ignoring of everything he has said in his past and done in his past by conservatives, that was the final straw for me. Okay. Where he has been supported, unlike any candidate in the past, by a block of voters. Yeah. Why Why do you think it is that he has the support that he does, especially from Christians? And I'm, I'm curious about your perspective from like the inside baseball. I have a very strong opinion of this. Conservatives, Christian conservatives in this country felt attacked by the Obama administration, rightly or wrongly. Rightly or wrongly, conservatives, Christian conservatives feel their way of life is under attack. Right? Would, would you, would, do you agree with me on this? I, I would say with that particular election between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, I feel like it was. I think you're going where I'm. Go- you're, you're you're going. You're, I think you you're. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could say attack attack from the Obama administration on a lot of things that they didn't necessarily approve of, and and they felt. But in my mind, I view it, and from my perspective, in hindsight, I look at it more like he was broadening the level of support for different people that live in this country, not targeting anything against Christianity specifically. But that's another conversation and we could disagree with that. Yeah, no, but no, no. I would agree with you that there definitely was a level of feeling targeted and attacked and feeling like they didn't have the freedom and that their faith was constantly being ridiculed and, and made fun of or not given the attention, especially after Bush, like yes. language that was constantly servicing the faith community. So, and that these people, the, these Christian conservative voters looked at Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump as as the last straw. They looked at it as, okay, it's an imperfect man in Donald Trump who says all the right things and who speaks his mind. That's that's real that's real important. He says what what they're thinking. He says what what I'm thinking, what XYZ yeah. on XYZ, whatever it is, whether it was in relation to a, a Christian political topic or not. And that's what really led to this. Yeah. And also the Supreme Court. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a good point too. What led to this outright support was, okay, there are some older conservative justices and there are some older liberal justices and whoever wins this gets to set the court for a generation. Yeah. And the president did. And we have a conservative Supreme Court for probably two decades. Yeah. And that's how they were able to set aside the issues that he has to vote for him. So then here's the question that I think, in my mind, it's something that I wrestle with a lot. And the reason, one of the biggest reasons I decided to leave, like the whole politics, political party world. The big thing that changed it for me was realizing that the Republican Party touting the religious community so much, uh, especially seeing the way that they did it with Donald Trump. It's all pla- It was all placating. It's Right. And my job, my number one job as a follower of Jesus is to go into the world and make disciples. Like that was the, that was the call, right? Yeah. And I looked at the way that Christianity was being associated with, or at the very least, 
how it was willing to turn a blind eye on certain things just to get the political aspects. So in that regard, it was like the ends justified the means. And there was a level of hypocrisy that was starting to bubble to the surface that I hadn't been aware of until that point. Yep. That I finally was just like, you know, I, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, like my, no, my the, commitment to following Jesus has to come first. And my commitment to following exactly. Jesus says that guy does not have the character that I can support. I, I just can't do it. Exactly. 100%. So, 100, 100%. And I'm, I'm with you 100% there. And part of what ha- over the past few years has completely driven me off the wall is the character of pastors of people around the country who what's the best way to put this have completely ignored what they have done what they have said in the past for political purposes to score political points and it's funny to consider that in in contrast to how the religious community responded to i mean Bill Clinton when he was in office, right? Exactly. Like, look at look at how look at how a certain individual, I'm not going to name names. You know who everyone knows who I'm talking <laughs> about. How two certain individuals talked during the Clinton years versus how they talk now. Yeah. Ab- about two men who have both made mistakes in their marriage. Yeah. And you tell me it's not political that it's not political reasons for them for them doing this yeah it's 100% it's very sad yeah and i understand and i'm i'm speaking to christian trump voters now i understand i do i un, i un, i understand that you feel attacked within the last administration i understand that and I understand that you thought this was the last chance. But don't put him up on a pedestal. It has gotten so bad that some of you, without thinking it, have made the man into an idol. Yeah. And y- y- you have. I would agree with that. Look yourself in, look yourself in the mirror and say you can say you haven't, but you have. Yeah. And here's here's the interesting thing that I think brings some of that to the surface. And you can talk about it with a specific candidate or just politics in general. I feel like a red flag for me when I realized in my life that politics was becoming an idol Mm -hmm. was when, well, there's a, a, a few red flags. The first was when I realized that I had this idea in my head that if we just elected all the right people, then everything would be great. And all of the problems of the world would be solved and, and, and man, like God would finally like, like Jesus would come back and we just got to get all the political people in office and all the right laws in place. Uh, Exactly. I had that, 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 that's an idol. That's worshiping an idol. All the Republicans that, that thinking, that thinking is, it it is an, it is an idol. It is that. And that's, and that's what it was. That's what it was for me. We need to get Republicans in office. And if you think that way currently, let me let me take you to school. I'm, <laughs> take I'm us gonna, to school, I'm, Bill. I'm gonna, take us to school. I'm gonna ta- I'm gonna ta- I'm gonna take I'm gonna take you to school. During the Bush and during the Bush administration. During the Obama administration, during the Trump administration. Okay? Well, let's just focus on those. In each one of them, there has been the party. In, in the Bush administration, the president at one point ha- had the House, the Senate, and the White House. What got done? Anything? Yeah. I mean, as far as those major issues that we keep like trying to champion. What are the what are the major what have been the major issues since the nineties in each election cycle? Social security, health care, abortion taxes and immigration going back let's go back to clinton even further you can go back further than that even the republican party has held all the white house senate the house all at one point 
the Democrats have held all at one point. Tell me what's been accomplished. The best point in this country was with a Democrat president, a Democrat Senate and a Republican House in the 90s. They were forced to get stuff done by working with one another. When they were forced to get stuff done. And now, just for political purposes, they refuse to work with each other. Yeah. It's a very different dynamic. Yeah, And even when they have complete control, nothing still gets done because they want the issue. Yeah. Immigration still is not being dealt with. Yeah. Okay, fine. You can say he's building a wall. But has an immigration bill been passed? Republicans have had their chances. They can work with the Democrats. That's the so-called big issue. Where's the immigration bill? They don't care. These people, they don't care. These people are there for the power. Not all of them. Not all of them. But a good number of them are there because they're there for the power. They're there for the prestige. They're not there to address the issues. They're not there to make a difference. Doesn't matter what they say at the town hall. The other thing I was going to mention that kind of was a red flag for me that this issue of politics was becoming an idol for me was when I took a step back and started to realize the way that I was thinking about viewing and treating those who were in my life Mm -hmm. or talking about them when they weren't around who had a different political opinion or a different political party than what I was affiliated with. Like the way that I spoke about them, the way that I treated them, the way that I viewed them Mm. was, I mean, it was as if I was on a battlefield with a massive sword in hand and was ready to go to war with them. And that, that was, that was big. That was big for me too. Because when I went to, when I, when I went to Greenville, it, it was like a different world for me finding out there were Christians who weren't also Republican. It was like my mind exploded. <laughs> and going up to Olivet, an even more conservative school than Greenville, finding out, wait a minute, everyone's not a Republican here? I, what? what? Yeah. How was that? What, what's, going, what's going on here? So then what did that do with the relationship you had with people when you found out that they were a follower of Jesus, but they weren't a Republican? What was going through your mind? Like, how did you view them? All the way on through from high school, where I would see that occasionally to Greenville and all of that, it was, it was very judgmental. And, and I'm still kicking myself for that. And it took me a long time to realize that You don't, (laughs) you can be apolitical and be a Christian. You can be liberal and be a Christian. You can be conservative and be a Christian. Who cares? Your political party doesn't matter. What matters is what's in your heart. What matters is, are you a believer? Are you a follower of Christ? And yeah, that's that's what matters. And are you are you working to help make other people know and follow Christ as well in an authentic way? Like exactly that for me was a real key paradigm shift because I realized that the level of intensity with which I was allowing my political worldview to impact my ability to be an effective witness for Jesus with those who are in my life who had a different political opinion than me. Like, wow, I'm, I'm letting politics get in the way of me doing my number one job as a follower of Jesus. Like, that's a problem. That is a huge problem. Exactly. And that's something that, again, I keep kicking myself for because I was more worried about what's your political party to anybody believers or non-believers. I was more worried about political party than any, than anything else. And it's something that took me a long time to get over. I I was, if you're not a Republican, you're not a Christian, right? That mindset is so dangerous. If you're a Christian, how could you be anything other than a Republican? Exactly. If you're if you're a Christian, how could you be anything other than a card carrying member of the Republican Party? Right. And that way of thinking is so dangerous and so backwards. Yeah, I feel like that 
line of thinking is something that, and this is again, going back to the word of idolatry, like it places the political party at the same level as following Jesus and his church. Yes. I'm sorry, but no, like that's not it. I mean, political parties come and go, governments come and go, whole nations come and go. But for the last 2,000 years, the Word of God and the church have remained. Exactly. That's a powerful statement of exactly who it is that you're following. When I was going through Proverbs 19, whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Matthew 25, Lord, when did we see your hunger, your thirsty? That infamous verse. Yeah. Jonah chapter 2, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Right. It's it's right there. Yep. It's all there in Scripture. And something that a lot of people who get involved in politics who come from the perspectives that you and I come from, Dan, is, is this dangerous to what we're really here for? The Great Commission. Right. What we're here for. Keep the focus where it needs to be. Yeah. And that's interesting. Those are the final words of Jesus before he goes. It's not go into all, go into the world and make Republicans. Right. It's go make disciples of all nations. See see that? Of all nations. Yeah. Like that, <laughs> that means you're going to be coming into conflict with a lot of different political beliefs and a lot of different religious beliefs and a lot of, like, there's a lot of stuff that you're going to be facing ideologically that are radically different than what I have taught you. And you need to be willing to deal with all of that with grace. If you are going to be reaching any of the world with what I've called you to part, part of the other thing that got me into politics was the idea of uh, American exceptionalism. Mm. When, When you say American exceptionalism, there's the political side to it, which is, we're America, we're awesome, this is how we roll, we've got all the big guns, deal with us. Or are you talking about like the theological, religious, God's got favor on our nation kind of thing? It's the theological, it's that side of American exceptionalism that I'm speaking to here where the United States is different, the United States is set apart. That's what I'm speaking to, and that's another factor that led to me getting into politics. And while... I do believe that the United States was founded on some biblical principles. The idea of American exceptionalism is, again, what has led to where we're at currently, which is Christian conservatives have this understanding that America was set apart. America is better than all the rest of the countries. America is different from all the rest of the countries from a theological perspective, is again what led to the love for the current president. Yeah. I look at the exceptionalism component. I look at the, I mean, my parents, even to this day, and they might even be listening, I'm sure uh, disagree with me on this. Love you, mom. Love you, dad. But when we talk about God's unique favor being on this nation, and then somehow that elevates us into a particularly specific or unique relationship with God. I'm sorry, but that sounds like pride. I agree. Like, it just sounds so prideful. Like the idea that Jesus came, I'll point out in the Middle East ding, to, ding, ding. to die for every person on the planet. And then we as believers are called to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And not going to the oh, United States, you're better than all the rest, so you have favor. It's right. it's ridiculous. I, I don't know how you look at that that attitude and not think, wow, that's really prideful. It is. And if, if there is a moment where like God shows some sort of unique blessing or favor to help this nation get started, or like there's all kinds of like conversations we could have about the history of America and, and how religion played a part in that and all of that stuff, that's great. But to think that we have had some kind of like special hedge of protection or whatever language people use that elevates us to a different level of connection and relationship and favor from the rest of the world, like that is just, that's pride. Yes. That's pride. I don't know how else you can describe it. It it originally, 
from a historical perspective, the idea comes from uh, Alexis de Tocqueville it, for, in, in, the, in, the eight, in the 1830s. I never say his name right. I've read his, I, I, <laughs> I can never say his name right, ever. Um, but where it really comes from is, is Reagan. Yeah. It was the, the probably honestly one of the three best speeches ever in my mind that he ever gave. One of the five to seven greatest speeches in the history of this country is the city upon a hill speech. Yeah. And that's where this modern idea of American exceptionalism from a theological perspective comes that's from. That's a great point. Very good point. Historically from de Tocqueville, but really from Reagan. To be honest, Bill, I'd never even I'd never even looked at it through that lens before. And I'm glad you pointed that out because I don't like I don't hate Reagan. Oh, I mean, by I no feel means. like he was a, yeah. a a good president. But I do think it's a great point that you're making that for him to use the language of a city set upon a hill as being the United States, that has theological weight behind it that is absolutely unbiblical. Like, there's no way that America is a city set on a hill. It's not. Yes. The city set on a hill is the church, and that's what Jesus was talking about in that verse and context. It's meant to be the exactly, church, exactly period, right. not a specific nation or a party. Exactly right. And I believed for a, the longest time that America was different. America was better than the rest. And, and it's just, it's, it's, not, it's not true. It's just that one wonderful speech is what set this whole idea of American exceptionalism in motion was, was that one speech from a quote um, by de Tocqueville taken, taken completely out of context from the 1830s and taking scripture out of <laughs> taking, taking scripture out of, out of context from, from the president as well. Yeah. And as, as I said, it, that's the issue that, that drives Christian conservative voters. Yeah. That, that's, that, that's a central theme, the central idea that drives them to the polls on an, on an, on a daily basis, that lone idea. What was it then about as, as far as like this mindset that like, if I'm going to be a Christian, I'm going to be doing politics. I feel like that's kind of the counter argument that I hear a lot from some people, which is, well, it's not an idol in my life because it's a tool that God is allowing me to use to advance his kingdom. And he wants me to do that. What would you say to people that say, well, this is just how God operates through the church in the United States. And that's what I feel called to. If, if you feel called to a life in politics, do it. Go for it. My one thing would be, have someone you tell every, everything to. And who you trust completely, who will call you out on your garbage. Mm -hmm. Because it's not easy yeah. to enter the political lifestyle and not let it consume you. Yeah. It's not easy. It consumes people every day. It destroys marriages. It destroys relationships on an everyday basis. Uh, okay. So final, uh, final parting thought here. How would you encourage people who maybe through our conversation are thinking, well, maybe politics is an idol in my life. What are some good steps that you took to remove this from being an idol in your life? And then if you were to go back into politics, what would you have in place now to keep it from becoming one again? Have an accountability partner, someone who knows you inside and out and will call you on it. That that's what honestly is what did it for me. And in your case, you're saying that was your wife. Was that the main person or are there other people you had in your life? It, my wife, my wife mainly, and my family to to a lesser extent. Politics was changing me. It was taking over 
like my moods were based on what was going on or it, it was just it was encompassing it was encompassing my life to where my wife called me on it in a way it, it was just in passing like a passing comment in regards to taking on a certain client just for the money she had said something along the lines of is this something you really should be doing mm. it was basically that simple and I took it and I did it and I did a darn good job at it and I kept realizing that this isn't someone who I could vote for. This isn't someone who I could support. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? That comment from my wife saying, where are you headed here? That led me to this, okay, what am I doing here? So that one conversation that was actually probably closer to 45 minutes or an hour in length that I boiled down to 30 seconds is, is what started this whole process. If you feel led to work in politics, all I'm going to say is be careful. Be careful about what specifically? About letting it consume your life. Become the thing that, that, you're, that you're worshiping in essence. Yeah. Um, because it's tempting. It's, it's very tempting. So if, if I were to go back and enter politics again, here's what I would do different. I would never again take a contract for a contract state okay. to take the income. So Never again. So what I'm hearing then is that you've officially sworn off making politics a career because yeah, no, ex exactly, no way exactly. you make politics as a career without being willing to do that to some degree. What you just said is what officially led to my leaving. Now, you can make a career on Capitol Hill working for a wonderful member of Congress or a wonderful senator, but on my side of the game, you really you can't look at it with the perspective that I have and make a full career out of it. So if you could talk to all of Christianity and finish this sentence by like writing a letter or something and just say, dear Christians, what, what would you say? Dear Christians, what? Dear Christians, I'm gonna keep this simple and to the point. Jonah 2.8 says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Don't let politics take over your life. Don't let it become an idol in your life. We're here to make disciples of all nations, not make Republicans or make Democrats. That's what we're here for. Look at your life like I am currently still working through mine almost four years after I left the political industry. Look at your life. Look and see if you're making politics an idol. That's what I would say. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. This is a, this is a good conversation. It's an important one. Hopefully it gave some people some stuff to think about. So, I hope so. I hope so. And thank you for listening to the Dear Christians podcast. If you want to learn more about our guest or if you'd like to partake in the conversation around this and other episodes, check us out on Facebook. It's just Dear Christians Podcast. We're also on Instagram, and you are welcome to join in on the conversation. Please share this episode if you found it interesting with someone that you think would be valuable to have this conversation with yourself. And continue to pray for us here at the Dear Christians Podcast as we continue to engage in challenging conversations that take an honest look at Christianity and culture.